Coming up on today's Hot Zone, we've got Dr. Ann Speckhard. She is with the International Center for the Study of Violent Extremism. She's an author, and I met her in Syria, and she's got some amazing stories to tell about talking to ISIS fighters in prison. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Okay, so we've got my new friend, Anne Speckhard, and it was really fun talking to you while we were over there in Kamishli at that little guest house. Tell me what you were doing over there, uh, Anne, and, and tell me a little bit about your work. Well, Chuck, um, I've been interviewing terrorists for about 20 years, and I've interviewed, I think it's 650 of them at this point. I'm a psychologist, and I've always been studying trajectories into terrorism and also what could bring people out of terrorism. So the last three, four years, I've been uh, concentrating on ISIS, as you can imagine. And we decided to start video interviewing um, before I just did paper and pencil interviews. And uh, also to expand our research to be a more action-based project that from a video interview that we would chop it down and create a counter narrative so that we would fight ISIS's online and face-to-face -face recruitment through what we were learning from the people that we were interviewing, provided that they agreed to that. And a lot of them are very willing to denounce the group. Really? Yes. So this is a question I've been asked a lot uh, since I came back from Syria. Uh, how committed are most of the guys who are Syrian or, or are ISIS fighters? I think that um, you would have found the most committed ones around 2014, 2015. And um, because that's a time when ISIS was really rich, ISIS had gained a lot of territory. Um, uh, well, 2015, they were already getting really badly attacked and beat up. And, uh, you know, as it became clear that they were establishing a totalitarian state, not an Islamic state, although they claimed it was Islamic, uh, more and more people got disillusioned. And um, so what we find is that there's three things, the extreme brutality, the un-Islamic nature, and the corruption in the organization are things that turn people really off. So quite a few. We've interviewed... 141 ISIS cadres at this point from all over the world. So I chase them anywhere in the world and uh, enter prisons, uh, visit them out in the open if they're returnees or defectors, and uh, interview them about who they were before they became a terrorist, uh, how they got attracted, why they joined. Um, what kind of training they took. Most ISIS people are forced into Sharia training and weapons training. Um, what task they were assigned to, how they liked the job that they were assigned to, how they liked living in the ISIS caliphate. You know, and some people say at first they loved it, um, but how it went long term. And uh, what were the things that disillusioned them? If they defected, why they defected, how they defected, if they got arrested. Uh, I talked to a lot of people in prisons. Um, uh, what happened when they were arrested? How do they feel now that they've had some chance to think about it? And if they're willing to, um, are they willing to denounce the group and give advice to others? So at the end of the interview, a lot of them will speak very emotionally about don't join. I ruined my life. Um, I thought this was a good thing. It wasn't. They weren't Islamic. Um, my best friend was killed. Um, I, they put me in prison and tried to torture me when I didn't want to fight for them. You know, whatever the story happens to be, and they're always horrible stories. Wow. Um, so what are the conditions like in the ISIS, in, in the prisons where ISIS is in Syria right now? The YPG, well, where we're interviewing in the Middle East is uh, YPG prisons, and um, I guess we have to call them detention facilities, and uh, also Iraq. And... Um, YPG really tries to uh, stick to European standards. So when people are first arrested, they say, sure, the interrogation was tough. So maybe they were roughed up a bit in interrogation. But 
they voluntarily tell us. I mean, we don't ask about prison conditions because it's not part of our research and we don't want to uh, uh, lose our access. Um, but they tell us, they treat us really well here, that it's, you know, we're not tortured, we're not mistreated, but they want to go home. Everybody wants to go home. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say that. Tunisians are afraid to go home because they're afraid they're facing really long prison sentences at home. Although most of them want to go home. They just wish that they didn't have to spend so long and they wish their government was different. Um, but Europeans for sure want to go home. You know, and we're seeing that right now. We have these two women, Huda Muthana and uh, Shamima Begum, begging to come home. Right. And um, how do you feel about that? I mean, it, you know, I've, I've been asked that question a lot today, you know, because we got a chance to, to talk with a lot of those ISIS wives. Some of them, like you said, were just like so done with ISIS. This is not what I expected. This is not what I thought it was going to be. And some of them were still pretty hardcore. And, um, you know, so how do you feel about that? Um, my view is uh, everybody we interviewed in Camp Roche, except for one woman, uh, and Camp Roche is the women's detention facility or one of the women's detention facilities, um, had small children. The children themselves haven't done anything. And in Europe, they're, um, uh, they're allowed passports. So I don't see how Europe can't be responsible for its own children. So if, you know, if someone's uh, uh, eligible for your passport and, uh, you know, basically is your child, your country's child, how can you leave them in a detention facility of an ally? That just makes no sense to me. And then you have the question of, if you send the child home and it's a young child, should you send them with their mothers? Most of the mothers that I talked to in prison sounded to me like they could pretty easily be rehabilitated. And most of them sounded repentant. They sounded um, like they understood that they needed to do prison time and willing to do it. So I think, you know, with a good psychologist, a good um, a mom to take them through what moderate Islam says and why ISIS was lying to them, uh, they'd probably do pretty well. And I, most of these women don't have blood on their hands. So it's a different situation than the men, where the men have killed. Right. And no. so knowing how brutal that those guys have been, and again, they were surrendering to us while, we, while I was there. And, and um, you know, that's a, that's a real dilemma. You, you, when you look at the brutality and you look at the effects of what those guys have done uh, what how should people approach that idea of what do we do with these thousands of guys now well the really hard thing for european countries and even for our own country is um can you collect evidence from the battlefield so if you bring them home to your country are you going to be able to prosecute them and you certainly don't want to bring home a killer that you're going to just have to let loose, mm -hmm. especially if he's still ideologically um, uh, aligned yeah. with the group. Right. But, and you're right. Some of them are still hardcore. Um, and some of them will not be rehabilitated. You may give them a long prison sentence and they're going to still stay with it no matter what you throw at them. Um, but others will be rehabilitated. So, that's that's the whole dilemma. Do you have evidence to prosecute if you can prosecute? And it also depends on what your laws were at the time they went. So if it's against the law, if they joined a designated terrorist organization and it was against the law in your country to give yourself to a terrorist organization. But some countries in Europe for the women uh, don't consider it. I think Germans don't consider it against the law for a wife to go and cook and support her husband who's in ISIS. They they said that's not that's not wow. against. Yeah, uh, wow. I mean she, she didn't join a terrorist organization. Right, right. In well, this, and uh, I remember interviewing one uh, French girl uh, mm -hmm. who from Dunkirk who said that she was brought to Syria when she was fifteen, and she said I was on board, I was sold on the idea before we came, but my mother brought my brought me and my sister here uh, and took us away from the rest of our family and then it didn't turn out to be what I thought it would be and now I want to go home but I'm very afraid that I'm going to have to go to prison and I don't want to go to prison. 
I think a 15 year old um, should be treated very differently than, I mean, she might be 18 now, but yeah, she's um, 19 now. Okay. But that's the whole issue with Shamima, the famous case in the UK. She was 15 when she left and she followed a schoolmate. So there were three girls in her school that a girl before them had gone. And the school, like most schools, sent a notice home. And it was in the backpacks or in the books of the kids. And of course, Shamima didn't give it to her parents, uh, warning them that a kid from the school had gone, so they should be more vigilant. And uh, so, you know, these three kids totally, um, you know, their parents weren't alerted. And uh, security officials obviously weren't watching closely enough. And for me, I felt the, the government and the school to a certain extent that a 15 year old um, made up her own mind and left. And I think any decision like that by that young of a girl needs to be judged as the offense of a minor, even though she's, yeah. she's 19 now. Yeah, I um, agree. I mean, she said uh, as much when we interviewed her, she said, um, you know, I wasn't right in the head. I was 15. I didn't know what I was doing. But uh, obviously she's gotten a big wake up call and has been living a medieval life positively for the last uh, four years. So that in, in and of itself may be punishment enough uh, for somebody like that. Uh, she couldn't wait to get back to France. But um, yeah. and I actually I, I asked her, does your family know that you are uh, that, that you're alive? And she said, no, my family in France has not heard from me in four years. And I said, would you like to call them? And she said, absolutely. And so I said, well, here's my satellite phone. And I gave her my phone and she called and left a message with some of her family members who then proceeded to just absolutely blow up my phone for the next couple of days trying to get back with her. But she was already on. Um, and, and of course, the U.S. military was not real excited that I had let an ISIS bride use my satellite phone. But I mean, I filmed her talking on the phone. I got every word that she said. I speak enough French to know that she wasn't giving them grid coordinates. And so, you know, I didn't feel bad about it. But uh, yeah, you're right. So, so on this last trip, uh, when you were there, what did you find? Tell me a little bit about what you saw just on this last trip to Syria. Um, well, we were mostly inside the prisons talking to ISIS guys. And uh, then we carried on to Baghdad and we're talking to more ISIS men and women. And um, in Baghdad, I think we talked to three that had just come out of Bagus only two weeks before. And in Syria, I think we talked to two that had just come out. So, you know, you were there on the front lines, you know more than I do. But we asked a lot of in-depth questions of how they're still uh, surviving uh, and how many are there, um, you know, what is the will to fight at this point. And most said, well, they said the fighters still had food that they had managed either to um, truck food in because they were doing exchanges uh, with the YPG to, for the YPG to get their prisoners back, which is understandable, you know, that you'd let a truck load of food go through if you could save a life of your fellow soldiers. And, um, uh, but that the common people were starving so much that they were um, uh, eating grass and things like this or, you know, boiling things that, you know, usually is for the cows. And um, some of the women told us that the helicopters came down. That I think these were U.S. helicopters and the YPG in the U.S. Uh, came into the, the houses and surrounded them. One young girl told us that she was in bed and her husband picked up his uh, uh, Kalashnikov and tried to fight back. They shot him dead. And uh, she was surrounded. And... Um, she said the YPG were pretty tough on her, but that our U.S. soldier stood in the way and said, don't touch her. And she was put into custody, which made me proud that, that our soldiers were behaving as they should. And, yeah. uh, you know, it sounded, uh, sounded terrifying. But um, basically, it sounds like there's a lot of women left. Um, and it sounds like Europeans left. People that can't pass as Syrians into Turkey, so they, they can't, uh, uh, and there's a lot of resentment that the Iraqi leaders managed to escape, that they had money and means to escape, and they left the rest of them sitting there, and um, it sounds like there is a will to fight, and you know, for some of them, 
and that they're just trying to find their escapes. And others just sound desperate to figure out how to escape. So a lot of them, and they were trying to get into Turkey, which concerns me that they think that Turkey is accepting. Oh, they are. There's no question about it. We we heard from uh, the fighters themselves and from the SDF that Turkey is uh, allowing these ISIS fighters to cross the border and change uniforms and put on Turkish uniforms. And uh, some SDF guys told us they found stacks and stacks of Turkish passports uh, that were blank that these guys were you know in in an ISIS uh, house. So they believe that Turkey is supporting ISIS and at least um, covertly supporting them. And that's the, that leads to my last question. What do you think is the end state for this? Uh, I mean, uh, they're going to clear out Baguz eventually, but what is the end state for the ISIS caliphate? Uh, end state is, uh, is there good governance and do people have hope in their lives and uh, uh, don't need to turn to these extreme movements to um, believe that they could have a chance at life? And uh, this is a question for both Syria and Iraq. And I, I hope that a semi-autonomous region is set up uh, or continues to run. Uh, it seems to me the YPG has done a pretty good job of governing and setting something up that looks democratic in the Middle East. That's to be applauded. And they've been Without good out doubt. with uh, fighting ISIS, so that's to be applauded. Uh, Turkey calls them terrorists. What I see is a lot of people dying fighting terrorists and fighting the worst terrorists we've ever seen right. in history. Uh, so if they manage to set up good governance and inclusive governance and democratic governance, um, they've got resources. Um, Mm -hmm. maybe we'll see the end of ISIS in that region. Uh, Iraq is another issue. Um, there's still, still, we're just going back to 2013, all the same issues, security violations, uh, grievances, uh, Mosul's not being rebuilt. Uh, it's not even being cleaned up. Uh, this is really concerning. And, uh, you know, so groups like ISIS can reform and claim, you know, through our religion that, you know, that people hold dear, uh, we're going to manage to bring something good in the face of corrupt politics. So without good governance, it's a real issue. And um, I don't, you know, when I ask myself, can they resurge? Two of the things that I think are a huge difference is I don't think this group will ever get its hands on resources the way it did, you know, to be so rich. And I don't know if they can still convince so many foreign fighters to come in. I think Like the cat's out of the bag. They know that it's... Well, I also think that in the beginning, so many people came because Assad was uh, carrying out such terrible atrocities against mm. his own people. And, and at the same time, the ISIS caliphate was being built. So it was this dream in opposition to something really evil, which attracts youth. You know, mm-hmm. idealistic youth are like, yeah, I'm going to go fight evil and build something good. Mm-hmm. And I think the cat's out of the bag as far as the good and the evil. Well, it's still there, but it's, you know, we're not seeing the same atrocities as we saw in the past. Yeah, not from the YPG and, and the SDF. So, um like mm-hmm. you say, let's hope that that goes. How can uh, more have people find out more about the International Study for the uh, Center for the Study of Violent Extremism? How can they find out more about you and your work? Well, we have a website. It's called icsve.org, mm-hmm. and we have a YouTube channel. So people that want to hear ISIS guys and women themselves telling their stories, they're uh, five-minute videos, and we have a hundred of them up on the YouTube channel already. They're also on our website. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can sit and have a video binge and listen to people tell their stories. They're also have, in lots of I, different languages. Yeah, I've seen some of those videos. And I'll tell you, folks, they are amazing. You've got to go Thank watch you. them. As a matter of fact, with your permission, uh, I will share some of them on the podcast. Sure. Uh, link link as you like. And then yeah. that'll make it easier for people to go and watch as many as they want. Great. And uh, we tell we make those videos for NGOs to use. Anybody that's fighting terrorism, we want them to use the videos. They're, they're free for people to use. So feel free to show them, share them, whatever works. Fantastic. Well... Dr. Speckard, I really appreciate your time. Uh, this, it's a fascinating interview. It was really fun meeting you over there. And I hope that uh, 
we'll get a chance to see you again and maybe have you on again sometime. Let's keep in touch. And I should say in parting, we named our project Breaking the ISIS Brand. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. Break that brand. Excellent. Very good. Well, that's it for today, folks. Thanks for watching The Hot Zone. I hope you'll be back again tomorrow. God bless you. Take care. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.